Welcome to Labor on the Job. I'm the host, Steve Zeltzer. Tonight we're going to be looking at the struggle of the Puerto Rican teachers, their fight against privatization in Puerto Rico, uh, a recent election that was held, and also uh, the relationship of the Puerto Rican Teachers Union to the SEIU in this recent election battle. And joining me this evening is Pedro Angel Rivera. Welcome to the show, Pedro. Thank you, Steve. And Pedro is a longtime filmmaker uh, and researcher on the history of the Puerto Rican working class. So uh, you're happy to have you here, and we're going to be showing some of your work. So why don't you talk about how you got involved in uh, making films, and uh, particularly about labor? I started making films uh, particularly connected to the Puerto Rican history of the working class um, going already back to 20 years ago. Um, I was um, in New York City interested in becoming a filmmaker and um, I started of course asking myself some key questions as to why I wanted to make movies and what I wanted to make movies about and of course and the, the obvious one to me at that, at that time was uh, to begin to answer why was I in New York City and uh, my relationship to the experience of the uh, tens of thousands of Puerto Ricans uh, that, that live in New York City then and, and still. You know, uh, as, as, as many people probably know, uh, there's close to a million uh, Puerto Ricans in, in, in New York State, most of them in New York City. And that large presence requires some explanation. Um, that explanation uh, lies at, in the migration experience as such that was produced by a, an, an industrialization strategy called Operation Bootstrap. It was the, the way in which the Puerto Rican government in uh, indirect uh, alliance with the United States government in the late 40s following the Second World War planned to bring capital to Puerto Rico to industrialize, transform the island of Puerto Rico from an agricultural society into a modern industrialized one, trying to make Puerto Rico a kind of showcase of development for the Americas turn the Puerto Rican colonial experience into a modern experience so that instead of uh, looking at Puerto Rico as a poor house of the Caribbean as, it, as they looked at it during the 1930s, Puerto Rico can become then a model of partnership between a metropolis and a territory. So that produced uh, what we call the massive migration following the post Second World War. Well they had promised to bring jobs to the people of Puerto Rico. It was a colony were now commemorating the 110th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Puerto Rico. But I mean, the United States at that time uh, said that they were going to help, as you say, Puerto Rico develop industry. Why did it mean that uh, so many Puerto Ricans, the majority of Puerto Ricans now live in the United States, have to leave Puerto Rico if they were going to be developing industrialization in Puerto Rico? Well, the, the, the reason why they, they, the Puerto Rican government had to face the challenge of producing jobs was because we had a massive situation of unemployment. And we had a massive situation of unemployment because the first three decades of U.S. rule in Puerto Rico, as of 1898, when the U.S. invaded Puerto Rico, those three decades produced massive unemployment because they, uh, as a result of the takeover of U.S. corporations, uh, sugar cane corporations particularly, tobacco. So U.S. corporations took over the, uh, the sugar cane. They took over the sugar cane, they took over the tobacco and uh, industry so that these corporations um, modernized, modernized the, the economy but also produced unemployment because there were really uh, factories in the fields and they dis basically destroyed the, uh, the what, what was a, what used to be a more labor intensive agricultural activity so they produced massive unemployment and in basically what happened was that these migrants that were sent uh, to the United States primarily were really the, the people who were the agricultural workers of previous decades. And uh, that way, the migration became a, a, a kind of a, a safety valve because really the industrialization as such did not produce enough jobs, never produced enough jobs, even at its height, uh, never produced enough jobs to compensate for that amount of unemployment. So that uh, as a result, there was, y yes, the s a certain amount of uh, economic progress took place in Puerto Rico because, you know, as I say many times, uh, if you have a, a big family, you get rid of a family of 10, you get rid of six, you know, your economic situation is bound to improve, even if you don't do that much for the four that remains. In our case, um, 
uh, the kind of factories that, are first came, that first came to Puerto Rico were labor-intensive factories, but also very exploitative of the labor in Puerto Rico. However, they were not as exploitative as the agricultural corporations that, that, uh, that preceded them. So it was an apparent you know, improvement in the conditions of the working class. However, we should not forget the conditions of the working class did not improve simply because jobs were created. They improved because there was a strong labor union, organized labor, uh, a strong organized labor force in Puerto Rico, a union movement that demanded better conditions for the Puerto Rican workers during the 40s. And in 1934, we're coming on the anniversary, the 75th anniversary of the 1934 National Cane Workers' Strike. What happened in that strike? 1934 is interesting because it really uh, pretty much marked the decline of, what, of the previous uh, stage of the in the development of Puerto Rican uh, the Puerto Rican working class the organized uh, Puerto Rican working class movement the uh, the the Federación Libre de Trabajadores the Free Federation of Labor was the first major uh, organized union movement in Puerto Rico during the first two decades of the early 20th century they did a pretty good job organizing workers however by the uh, late 30s by the mid 30s they have pretty much become very weakened partly because some of his leadership was bribed. Uh, it became very reform-oriented and very dependent uh, on the uh, AFFL and, and on the AFFL bureaucracy at the time. So it was not really stopped organizing uh, workers uh, like it was organizing at the beginning. It was pretty much a craft union. It was craft union uh, uh, base so that um, the, re the majority of the workers that were really around, you know, that have really, they were present in the industry at the time were really sugar, sugar cane workers. These were proletarianized workers. The, uh, AF, the FLT did organize, Federation of Free, Free Federation of Labor did organize its workers, but not really uh, 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 with the efficiency that had been organizing before, not with the militancy that it had been organizing before. So by 1934, there was a, they were negotiating a contract and in the eyes of many workers, they felt that the, uh, the, the union was really selling them out. So they, they went into this wildcat strike that, that became a national strike. And it became a national strike not only against their own union bosses, but also against the government, who was in, 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 in coalition with the sugar corporations. So they were facing, uh, you know, a so three fronts. enemies. <laughs> three they fronts. They were fighting their union leadership. Yeah. They were fighting the... Uh, owners, the company owners, and they were fighting the government. It's Correctly, yeah. yeah. So that, yeah. Uh, that made it, a, that, that made it a, a, a very important movement. It became a social movement, a protest. It went beyond the confines of a typical, you know, labor management conflict. And uh, so it kind of dramatized the crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, remember 1934, we were in the midst also of the worldwide capitalist crisis. As we are in today now. As we are in today, as we, as we begin to uh, go into the, the first phase of what I feel will be probably something as bad as the 30s or worse. That's right. Now, why would the AFL, American Federation of Labor, uh, this was what it was before it merged with the CIO, why was the AFL in, in Puerto Rico? Because, I mean, there were millions of workers in the United States who had been unorganized. Why, what, what were they doing in Puerto Rico? Well, at first, the, F, the, the AFL, the American Federation that of Labor. That was Samuel Gompers who was president. Right. Uh, during, the, uh, during the presidency of Samuel Gompers, uh, the, that first stage of, of, of involvement of the AFL in Puerto Rico was primarily due to the, uh, the fear uh, and of, the, of the AFL leadership, uh, particularly Gompers and his people, that if they didn't organize, uh, particularly the, the cigar makers in Puerto Rico and the tobacco workers, and other workers in the agricultural sector, they could become uh, unfair competition, you know, cheap labor for the U.S. workers. So, of course, they, they felt that, you know, it was in their interest, in their business labor interest, to organize these workers. And I could imagine that there was still some, some drop of, uh, you know, class consciousness in Gompers, enough to, for him to also believe that it was important for Puerto Rican workers to be organized and, and, and improve their, their standards of living. So I don't think it was just a calculated, a totally calculating business move, but mm -hmm. certainly that was part of it. Uh, that was the first stage. Now the second stage, following the Second World War, with Operation Bootstrap coming up, 
it was a different story. Because here we, we already have a, an American labor bureaucracy much more developed along the lines of business unionist corporate type of uh, labor organizing. You know, already labor has become a big business. And there was a purge in the United States during the McCarthy period where people like Ronald Reagan helped purge the unions of leftists, militants, socialists. At that time, what was going on in Puerto Rico at that time? A similar process. In Puerto Rico, in, in, during the 1940s, as I mentioned before, there was a, there was a strong labor movement. Uh, and that labor movement was led by progressive people in the labor movement, socialists, some of them uh, affiliated with the Communist Party, but primarily progressive labor people. And uh, they were uh, demanding better working conditions for the workers and, and also more participation in terms of the workers in the national affairs. Uh, but Second World War came in, erupted, and um, many of these workers believed that the Second World War was a war, uh, a war that was a just war, so they went and fought the Nazis. And when they came back, uh, they found themselves in a situation where the government, in alliance with the corporations, uh, pretty much repressed them. You know, the Taft-Hartley law was implemented in Puerto Rico. In 1950, there was uh, other, the Smith Act ap applied to Puerto Rico. Uh, many repressive type of uh, laws were applied to Puerto Rico as well. You know, Puerto Rico being a colony of the United States at that time. Most people don't know that. Isn't it a colony now, too? It's still a colony. Uh, but uh, then it was a, a, a much more uh, obvious uh, type of colonial situation because we didn't even have 1947. We did not have uh, a, we did not have an elected governor. Oh, I see. So you had no local. Autonomy. We didn't. We didn't elect a governor oh, in I 1947. See. It was until 1948 that we elected our first governor. Oh, I see. And. Prior to that, uh, during the early 40s, we did have a, a, a fairly progressive governor, colonial governor nonetheless, who was uh, not totally hostile towards the labor movement. Mm -hmm. In a similar fashion like Roosevelt, I mean, kind of like fairly friendly to labor, at least in some, some ways. Uh, but following for 1947, as anti-communist and anti-socialist and, 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 and plain anti-labor politics, take command, then uh, the situation changes. So a, a different kind of labor union comes into the scene. And this is where the ILGWU, for example, comes into Puerto Rico. International Lady Garment Workers Union. Correctly. Uh -huh. uh, they come into Puerto Rico and they, they come in with uh, factories, with industrial capital that is invited by the Puerto Rican government to industrialize the island. And they come in as a package. The factories come in with the unions. The factories come in with yeah, the unions. Yeah, it's a package. It's a package deal. <laughs> it's a package deal. They so in other words, U.S. unions make a deal with the multinationals. Yeah, they come together. To, to come together to Puerto Rico and to, uh, well, did the workers have any choice about these unions? They, have, they didn't have much choice uh, in the sense that uh, at first these unions, they were the only ones available to them because uh, a lot of the unions that were there before we're organizing workers in the agricultural sector I see. and in the public sector. And in these new factories that came in, they faced a lot of restrictions and a lot of repression. So these other unions came into a situation where it was more favorable to them. They had the support of the government. And they had the, the support the of industry. And, the industries. and they were promoting industrial peace. The local Puerto Rican unions that went along with that plan of industrial peace also got a piece of the pie. But those unions who did not go along with the program of industrial peace were repressed I and they see. were pushed out of the picture. So the government in alliance with the employers and U.S. supported unions basically uh, tried to isolate and marginalize the indigenous or, or the independent unions in Puerto Rico. Yeah, the more independent unions, they were, they were pushed aside. And, uh, and they did this by, by pushing aside any kind of political support and by repressing them. Uh, you know, ap applying applying laws that were repressive and, and persecution, because a lot of these unions, their leaders were pro-independence, were at least anti-colonialists, and there was a lot of repression against anti-colonialist forces at that time. Now, 
following this uh, bootstrap, Operation Bootstrap, which you've done a film about called Operation Bootstrap, is, a, I think, a classic film on the economic development of Puerto Rico, a very important contribution to understand that. It, it forced, as you say, a massive migration uh, to the United States right. in which uh, the majority now Puerto Ricans are in the United States, they're not in Puerto Rico. What impact did that have on families, on the working people of Puerto Rico, this, this mig forced migration? Well, you know, uh, like any f forced migration process of that type, and in the case of Puerto Rico, um, you know, it, it has been characterized, a massive migration of Puerto Ricans to the United States has been characterized as one of the most intense and massive phenomena of that type. You know, I guess you could think about the Irish migration, if you want to think in terms of comparing it to uh, another massive phenomena like that. The mm -hmm. Irish migration is comparable. The Irish migration and the Puerto Rican migration are very similar in that respect, you know. The people are, workers are pushed out in a situation uh, of crisis. And of course the migration is justified on, on the basis that it will improve the lives of workers by giving them a chance to go someplace else to sell their labor. And they're U.S. Uh, citizens or they have U.S. rights, U.S. passports, so they can't come to the United States. Right, and the, and the, uh, the situation of Puerto Rico as a territory, is, it, the duality of it allows uh, Puerto Ricans to migrate uh, as citizens. And it's interesting because uh, as Puerto Ricans you, you migrate from a situation where you're a colonial citizen. You, for example, in Puerto Rico, you, uh, to this day, you're not, uh, you're an American citizen, but you, I cannot vote for the president. I can vote in the primaries, the primaries of the Democratic Party, I or the see. Democratic Party, or the Republican Party, if they, when they're held in Puerto Rico, we could vote in those primaries, but you cannot vote in the, directly in the elections. We don't, we don't have that right. But if you migrate to the United States, then you become a full citizen. If you migrate back, you become a colonial citizen again. <laughs> in my case, I, I spent many years in the United States, and I have full rights as a citizen, at least legally speaking, right? Formally speaking. I moved back to Puerto Rico. I, I'm back to my colonial status as a citizen. So you go back and forth between colonial and Yeah, and US so you literally, the minute you cross, the, uh, you, you cross that border, <laughs> uh, you're allowed to come in, but you lose rights. Many people don't realize that that's the case. I mean, it's as automatic as that. You change residency. It's like if you moved from uh, California to New York and <laughs> all of a sudden you don't in New York you can't vote for the president move back to California you can I see and in our case you move to Puerto Rico which is a territory of, of American citizens you don't vote for the president now this uh, immigration mass immigration in the United States um, and the role of uh, unions in Puerto Rico what were some of the struggles um, following this uh, Operation Bootstrap of the Puerto Rican work class that took place? Uh, I mean, was there a struggle against privatization or what were some of the other economic policies that took place in Puerto Rico? For uh, close to 30 years, you know, since uh, the late 40s through the uh, early 70s, there was uh, the strategy of so-called industrial peace di did succeed uh, because it, there was a a fairly steady uh, economic process of job creation so that unemployment did, you know, was reduced to, uh, to an extent. I mean, it was never reduced dramatically, but there was enough stability because mm -hmm. uh, people did get um, better paying jobs. And sure. But of course, it was not a frictionless situation. Uh, there, were, there were many labor conflicts, but there were labor conflicts that were fairly contained. In fact, I would say that that history still has not been told. Even in, in when we did the film on Operation Bootstrap, we hardly uh, touched the surface of those conflicts. But, uh, but there was a certain amount of conflict, but it was pretty much within constraints. Now, uh, by the early 70s, as Puerto Rican workers become fully industrial and a fully industrialized force, and develop more consciousness and realize that it's, you know, it's been a few years, they've been producing wealth for these corporations, they deserve, uh, inflation goes on, that doesn't stop, you know, That's cost right. of living goes on, keeps going up, and you get the typical pressures of uh, a, working, a, work, a worker in any industrialized country, you begin to demand more. And American labor unions then began to be questioned by some Puerto Rican workers. And 
you know, unions like in the case of uh, the, petrochemi the petrochemical industry, the, to give you an example, the, uh, the OCAO, the uh, Oil Chemical Workers Union. Mm -hmm. They were organizing petrochemical workers in Puerto Rico. And uh, they came to a point where workers were not satisfied with the performance of these unions in their defense. So they voted them out. And uh, they developed their own independent union. And so was the case with other unions, with other, other sectors of, in which uh, there were American unions and uh, Puerto so, so Rican the, the So the Puerto Rican working class began to feel that, that these American unions in Puerto Rico now were not really representing their interests. Well, not really representing their interests in the best way. They, they, they saw them as businesses that were not really uh, doing the best for them. So they developed uh, an independent response to that. Now, this, this is what led to uh, a period of a decade of a lot of militancy uh, in the union scene in Puerto Rico, led by this independent union movement. It is in this context that the Puerto Rican Teachers Union began to develop, and other unions as well. Uh, so when did the Puerto Rican Teachers Union begin to develop? The, uh, the early uh, organization form that led to the union eventually uh, was uh, a, a workers' organization, a, a kind of union form that was called a bona fide workers' organization. It was on a full-fledged union because it was in the, within the public sector. And at that time, workers within the public sector, is with the exception of those who worked in, in utilities uh, corporations, were allowed to organize, but only very in a very restricted way. They Did they have the right to strike? They didn't have the right to strike. Or they, they couldn't really uh, negotiate, negotiate uh, full-fledged uh, collective bargaining I agreements. See. It wasn't until later in the 90s, in the 90s that they really uh, were able to obtain those rights. And even then, they still couldn't get the right to strike as part of the uh, deal. Well, there was a, a general strike in Puerto Rico. There was a general strike in the uh, 90s, uh, and that was led, in fact, by uh, independent, the independent labor unions uh, in the telephone company. The telephone company at the time was a public utility and generated a lot of profits. And the government uh, decided they were going to privatize it and sell it to the private industry, private capital. And uh, that generated a lot of opposition, not only amongst the telephone workers, but other workers who understood that the telephone industry was really important. And uh, profitable, and the, the money went into education. And yeah, it was a public society. utility, so it, you know, it, it it was patrimony of a uh, you know social, owner. it was socially uh, patrim oh. you know patrimony of the of the of society. It wasn't a private uh, privatized profit making concern, and uh, so it 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 yield benefits, and so that was that was uh, that generated a lot of support and that massive uh, that was a massive um, strike. It generated support from all sectors of the population. It was quite uh, militant. And it led to uh, fairly serious confrontations uh, between workers and the police and other sectors. Uh. In, in that context, the teachers and other workers play a very important role. Because uh, earlier, just a few years earlier, by 1993, the teachers themselves have fought a battle against privati privatization uh, within the uh, Department of Education uh, in the form of the charter schools. Uh, the Department of Education began to push the notion of charter schools. Teachers Federation struck against it, in, oh. in protest against it. Okay, well, why don't we take it at this point, a break, sure. and there's a video that uh, has been produced. You were the director of it on uh, some recent developments of the Puerto Rican Teachers Union, um, and we'll come back to you after we go to this segment. Sure. On September 13, 2007, the Puerto Rican Teachers Federation held the largest delegates assembly in their history. Feeling tired and disrespected after trying to negotiate a collective bargaining agreement for more than two years, the overwhelming majority of the delegates approved the use of the strike as their ultimate weapon to force the bosses to negotiate. Two months later, 
on November 11, 2007, a General Assembly was held. The democratic will of the teachers' voices was expressed loud and clear, and the strike vote was once again approved by an overwhelming majority of members. Although aware of the fact that with their vote, they were openly challenging the legally imposed strike ban under law number 45, teachers felt that they had no choice given the boss's stalling tactics and their frequent violations of the previous collective bargaining agreement. In an effort to neutralize the teacher's challenge, government officials retaliated and used the Labor Relations Commission to trample the rights of association and free speech of our union members. On January 8, 2008, the Puerto Rican Federation of Teachers was decertified. This decertification included other punitive measures such as a freeze in the collection of union dues, a freeze on the collective bargaining negotiations, as well as threats of heavy fines and other penalties against the union's leadership. In response to these repressive actions, the teacher's spirit of struggle became stronger. The Federation's leadership announced that the strike vote could be put into effect any time after February 1, 2008. On February 11, the Federation was able to obtain a temporary ruling which forced the Department of Education bosses to return to the bargaining table. However, the bosses refused to prioritize the discussion of substantial issues during the bargaining process and stonewalled the talks. On February 17, 2008, La Gran Marcha por la Educación Puertorriqueña, the Great March in support of Puerto Rican education was held. More than 35,000 teachers, students, parents, and other labor union supporters marched toward the La Fortaleza, the colonial governor's house, and demanded a return to the bargaining table and the signing of the collective bargaining agreement. The Teachers' Federation top bargaining priorities were to stop the Department of Education's veiled moves to privatize public education through the so-called charter schools and to improve the school's working and learning environment through measures such as a decrease in the maximum number of students allowed per classroom, more and better resources to teach special education students, appointment of teachers prior to the beginning of the school semester, true school autonomy, and effective community participation in the school educational plan. On February 18th, in direct response to the public pressure of the Great Teachers March, the Secretary of Education, Rafael Aragunde, agreed to sign a stipulation against the establishment of charter schools and other forms of privatization. In spite of this conciliatory move, Aragunde and his negotiating team continued to stall the negotiation of key items within the new collective bargaining agreement, forcing the Federation's leadership to implement the strike vote. On Wednesday, February 21st, in the afternoon, the Executive Committee of the Federation of Teachers officially announced that the teacher strike would be put into effect as of Thursday, February 22, 2008. For 10 
consecutive days under a harsh and repressive economic and political climate, thousands of teachers, mostly women, clashed against a boss fully committed and equipped to crush our movement. From the very beginning, both Secretary Aragunde and Governor Acevedo Vila claimed that the mass of teachers would not be willing or able to carry off a strike and that at best the strike would only hold for a day or two and have a disabling impact on very few schools. Yet the militancy of the Federation's leadership and rank and file members proved that the government's predictions were dead wrong. Aragunde and Acevedo Vila, the boss's representatives, never imagined that during 10 long and intense days, the teachers would fight their stubbornness and unflexible behavior with such an unusual spirit of militancy and sacrifice. We held our ground from February 22nd through March 5th. About 20,000 teachers supported the strike. 8,000 of us were active on the picket lines with the support of students and parents. Students' absenteeism was a crucial factor in paralyzing the school system. While many schools were officially open, normal classroom activity was virtually shot down in the vast majority of cases. Never in the history of the teacher strikes in Puerto Rico have we had such a high level of participation and militancy. Thousands of young women teachers, las maestras, surprised many of us with their everyday commitment and sacrifice, both in and outside the picket lines. Neither the repressive threats nor the wage deductions the lies of the commercial yellow press news analysts and reporters or the ill-intended character assassination attempts against our leadership along with the official government propaganda lies and the intimidation of the police through their use of specialized shock troops were able to stop us from our commitment to demand respect for our dignity as education workers. Such bravery and commitment in the defense of our public schools and of our class interests as workers is the most powerful testimony of our Federation's indestructible character. Here lies the real force behind the successes and achievements of our strike. The strength of our strike was most dramatically displayed by the fact that in scarcely seven days we organized four national rallies where thousands and thousands of teachers and our supporters projected a powerful collective voice. The weakening atomization of the teachers under the boss's intimidating pressures gave way to the experience of the streets as a huge collective classroom. As we say in Spanish, la lucha educa we learn by struggle. The strike was a school for all kinds of people who were able to rethink the real state of affairs of our public school system and the teacher's commitment to struggle for true educational excellence. Never before in our history had public education been spotlighted so brightly in the mass media. On the streets, the state of the schools and the teachers' demands were the staple item of popular conversation. Mass popular support was evident everywhere in spite of the persistent climate of hostility and repression created by the government bosses and their allies in the private sector. In fact, as the strike became stronger and a more positive dialogue had made room towards the final completion of the new collective bargaining agreement, we had to face the disagreeable fact that the SEIU International and local labor leaders, Dennis Hickey Rivera 
and Roberto Pagan, among others, were working behind closed doors to pressure the governor and the Secretary of Education into stopping their negotiations with our Federation's leadership. We also learned that this lobbying pressure was rooted in the fact that the SEIU had pledged to fundraise close to $4 million towards the governor's re-election campaign. In exchange, the government officials would then cooperate to help destroy our federation, clearing the road for the SEIU to take over. As a broad societal phenomenon, our strike had a deep impact on the everyday lives and worldview of thousands of people from all walks of life. A huge number of teachers who had never experienced labor stoppages or strikes had to face their fears and insecurities cold turkey within a very harsh and repressive economic and political climate riddled with threats to be heavily fined or fired. This experience has had a deep and lasting impact. In this context, we must also highlight the fact that our strike had a woman's face. 82% of our teachers in the public schools are women. Many of us are single mothers. Having to deal with the complex tasks and demands of a strike such as this one often meant being labeled and treated as criminals by the state while at home confronting the burdens of housework, child care, and chauvinist attitudes and pressures from non-cooperative husbands or domestic partners. Such challenges made the strike a process of struggle for both personal and social emancipation. Teachers had to fight not only for their dignity and respect as workers, but also as women, oppressed by the taboos of sexist society. On March 5, 2008, more than 13,000 teachers gathered in a general assembly. We decided to put a halt to the strike process, return to the classrooms, regain strength, and renew more resources to continue what has indeed become a protracted struggle. What have we accomplished? We forced the bosses to respect our demands. We learned and taught many lessons about the meaning of dignity and solidarity. And although we still do not have a new collective bargaining agreement, the Secretary of Education issued a memorandum in which the Department of Education commits itself to pursue the following. Number one, immediate action against the charter schools and other forms of privatization. Two, to preserve the status quo regarding the terms and regulations of employment conditions while guaranteeing key labor rights earned by teachers as of the previous collective bargaining agreement. Three, a $250 base salary raise effective as of July 1st, 2008, increasing the base salary of teachers in Puerto Rico from $1,500 per month to $1,750. Four, a commitment to raise the monthly base salary of teachers to $3,000 and to allot 25% of the government bond issues toward the development of the public school system. Five, a guarantee that no disciplinary reprisals will be taken against teachers who went on strike. After the strike, the struggle continues. The teacher strike transformed the Puerto Rican Federation of Teachers. Today, we can draw from the experiences of thousands of new leaders 
forged during the strike, capable of fighting government bosses at all levels of struggle. We were the first workers' organization certified as an exclusive union representative in 1999 and the first one to be decertified in 2008. We have no doubts that the Puerto Rican Federation of Teachers will become the first union to be recertified once new trade union elections are held. We have already submitted the necessary endorsements required under Law 45. Hence, we are legally qualified to participate in any forthcoming elections. The teacher strike proved that the Puerto Rican Federation of Teachers, La Federación de Maestros de Puerto Rico, is our most powerful weapon. La Federación ni se rinde ni se vende. We never surrender and we never sell out. There is no victory without struggle nor struggle without sacrifice. No hay triunfo sin lucha, ni lucha sin sacrificio. Decir aquellas palabras Contar números extraños Escribir las primeras letras Con el amor de su mano Welcome back to Labor on the Job, and we just saw this segment on uh, the, the teacher struggle in Puerto Rico and this uh, uh, battle against uh, privatization and also the tremendous repression that came down on the teachers during the strike. Um, so there was a strike, and that was in February of 2008. 2008, correctly, yeah. And uh, it, sound, it seems like thousands of teachers were involved in that. It was a mass, uh, mass teacher strike. It has been the most uh, massive strike teachers I've ever been involved in the whole history of teachers in Puerto Rico uh, ever since there were teachers in the public schools. Uh, there's never been a, a, a strike like that. Um, previous, in previous occasions, like I mentioned before, in 1993, they did strike for a couple of days. Uh, in 1974, they struck for one day. And there was a certain amount of, you know, there were involved, there, there was, there were several hundreds of teachers involved in 1993, was uh, a bit more than that. A couple of thousand teachers were actively involved, but this time in 2008, uh, there, there was a point uh, in the strike, there was a moment in the, uh, during the strike where about 20,000 teachers were on the street. And this is really in the context of a very uh, repressive, hostile environment against the uh, teachers for striking because mm -hmm. teachers were challenging politically uh, the colonial state by striking because under the current law, s the right to strike is denied to teachers and other workers in the public sector. Now the constitution guarantees the right to strike, however. So um, the teachers were exercising their constitutional right to strike. So, so for those folks who say that the, the, the strike was illegal, well, that's questionable because, you know, the Constitution does guarantee well, that even, right. I mean, I mean, that's a basic right to strike, I mean, to withhold your labor. Correct. And, and um, whether, whatever the law says, it used to be illegal to form unions in the United States, um, probably in, in, uh, in, Puerto, Rico in as well. Puerto Rico as well. So people had to break those laws. Workers had to break those laws and fight for their rights. I mean, they didn't, nobody handed them their rights. And, and obviously that the Puerto Rican teachers were saying that they didn't accept the law that says they didn't have the right to strike. Correct. And, uh, you know, people don't, don't break laws just to break them. <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, in this case, well, it's because they, it, well, it was, it was, they were pushed. Well, in this video, I mean, one of the things that it, the video says is that the, this fight against charter schools, privatization of schools, which is endemic now in the United States, uh, uh, was something that the, teach, the teachers felt was an issue of principle and they could not, not accept charter schools in Puerto Rico, uh, even though that was being pushed by the governor and 
W were you shocked or surprised by the role of the SEIU in that strike to support the governor and to uh, intervene in, in the negotiations that kind of shut you down, shut the teachers down? Well, I was in shock, and I don't think teachers in general on the island uh, from the Federation were shocked because uh, we have known uh, about the role that the SEIU leadership from the United States uh, with uh, participation of Puerto Rican labor leaders in Puerto Rico and in the United States. Uh, Dennis Hecky Rivera is a well-known uh, labor leader in the United States from this uh, member of the SEIU, and he was directly involved in, in lobbying. Uh, with the Puerto Rican governor uh, so that the negotiations that were taking place uh, between the Puerto Rican Teachers Federation and the Department of Education were, you know, uh, w would be put to a stop. Uh, because in spite of the fact that the strike was considered illegal, the Department of Education was negotiating with the teachers. Negotiations were going on and economic demands were being uh, satisfied. But there were, like you mentioned before, that, that there were other issues of principle that were went deeper, uh, such as the privatization, you know, the whole issue on charter schools, mm -hmm. uh, control over the workplace issues, that, that were the issues that the teacher federation felt were most relevant to teachers. Not that economic issues were not important, but that there were issues that, uh, you know, that were really carried further. And that's where it, the negotiations were being, uh, were being stalled. And in fact, they were stalled for negotiations were very slow and it took, uh, the reason why teachers had to, teachers had to go on strike is it took them almost 30 months. So they've been trying to negotiate a collective bargaining agreement for t almost so 30 they months. So they were just stalling and-, and Yeah, and it's and not like they- you know. Well, I mean, uh, Andy Stern, who's now the president of the SEIU and one of the leaders of the Change to Win, uh, wasn't he previously in uh, uh, Puerto Rico at the behest of J uh, John Sweeney, who was the president of the AFL-CIO, negotiating with the governor there at that time to privatize the health care system in Puerto Rico? Yes, because the, the SEIU has, a, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of concern, in, interests, uh, economic interest concerns within the health industry. And uh, of course, the, uh, as the Puerto Rican health industry is, w the, the health system, the, the public health system was privatized. Uh, when did that take place? That took place uh, in the uh, late 80s. Yeah, and, uh, and previous to that, it, it started previous to that. It was during the uh, the governorship of uh, Pedro Rosselló, so that was uh, you know it was during the eighties and and um, but then it continued to they continued to develop that process of privatization and, and threatened to extend it to other areas. This is where you know the the situation with schools became an issue because uh, even though. In, in the early 90s, the government had apparently stopped this initial drive to privatize schools. They began to, again, re, you know, uh, renew their efforts in, in that direction. And this all in the, in the name of uh, improving uh, education. And, you know, the privatization is always, it's always, it's always uh, defended in the name of improving something. Well, I mean, it, I mean, Puerto Rico used to have a national health care system. Everyone used to get health care and you didn't have to have private companies. Now uh, you have companies like Humana, these profit companies now in Puerto Rico who are basically uh, deciding whether you get health care on the basis of how much you can pay. And I, I mean, it seems like that the record of Andy Sterner, uh, some of the work that he did there has a long history as far as... Oh, it goes back, yeah. It, you know, it, it, labor unions like the SEIU and, uh, and others are... Uh, as people, many people know, they, they are large corporate concerns. And, and uh, when they are enter a labor market, uh, and they, they're gonna really lobby on a large scale. They don't, they don't simply go and negotiate with, you know, individually with a hospital. Or they, 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 they negotiate with the government. They go and make deals and, and lobby. And uh, of course, the 40,000 teachers of the Puerto Rican Teachers uh, uh, Federation. I mean, that's a large group of teachers to have won. Now, they- it's a lot uh, of dues there. A lot of dues money, a lot yeah. of dues money. So the, uh, how much money did the SEIU spend in Puerto Rico trying to take over the teachers union? Well, they, it is estimated that they spent around $20 million. And it, this is probably money from U.S. union members, SEIU members in the United States. Primarily. <laughs> so they spent U.S. SEIU members money going into Puerto Rico to raid the Puerto Rican Teachers Union. What, what does that say about the SEIU and this kind of unionism? 
Well, it, you know, it's like it, the same goes for other corporations as uh, that they go to Puerto Rico, they don't pay taxes in Puerto Rico, you know, uh, or they pay very little tax. And we get federal funding in Puerto Rico. Where, does that fe where do those federal funds come from? They come from the taxes that the American working class pays and the Puerto Rican working class pays in the United States. So they go there to subsidize corporate profits. Same way um, the dues that the American workers pay in unions like the S S conglomerates like SEIU, they go to subsidize the business ventures of corporate union conglomerates like SEIU in Puerto Rico. You know, it, it is very, they operate like corporations. So in that sense, American workers of all nationalities are subsidizing the business ventures of these unions, you know, these union corporate uh, ventures and these U.S. corporate ventures in Puerto Rico. And in, in a way, it's the same phenomenon. Now, so they lost the election, so it was a bad investment. Bad investment. <laughs> But investment, uh, and uh, I'm afraid a, a few heads will roll because uh, I, I know people personally involved in, in on both sides of the <laughs> of the you know of, of the arena. In this case, people who work in the SEIU that I've known over the years, and people who you know, it's, it's a relatively small scene there. So you get to know people, and and I, I saw they they were quite upset about the this. They thought they were going to win it. There was a ballot in which the yeah. FMPR, the real union, was prevented from being on the ballot as a result of its decertification. And you had the SEIU supported union, which was mainly uh, principals and management, school management, uh, oh, trying yeah. to get representation. Yeah, and, and the Puerto Rican Teachers Federation had, had, had really been under a lot of uh, ba real bad rap by the media and uh, a lot of hostility, bad media coverage, you know, so that people were very confused regarding the, the status of the, of the union, the, of the federation, the teachers' federation. They, a lot of people were, were really betting on the fact that the federation that after the strike was going to disappear. So this victory is a very significant victory. Extremely right? significant because uh, it, following the, uh, the halt, uh, teachers decided to put a halt on, on the strike to go back to their workplace and regain strength and, and continue the battle from inside the classrooms. And they had an assembly, and in that assembly, you know, they had over uh, 12,000 teachers, out of which eventually more than 11,000 endorsed them. Um, this is right after a very tiresome strike. People, who, you know, were but the really teachers obviously felt that the that the FMPR, that union, was really going to fight for their interest. And the structure of it, it was you, uh, all officials are elected, all officers are elected. There's a term limit. Uh, for all the officers, and also the salaries are the same as the teachers. Well, that's so the that's kind of a different uh, structure than you have in most U.S. unions. Many unions, uh, the officials are there for life; their families are there. It's it's like a family business for for a lot of unions. In the United that's States. the key right there. You know, uh, the teachers' federation probably spends if they spend fifty thousand dollars trying to uh, defend themselves against this labor rate during a, this less than a month, uh, while the uh, SEIU spent. Twenty million dollars in less than a month. Uh, you know, that's <laughs> I it's a sharp difference. You figure, well, what what made the difference there? Well, the difference is because one is a top-down organizing strategy, really without much knowledge of what the base, what the grassroots really think. While the other one is a democratic union that is has a fairly good uh, record of communication at the grassroots level. They know their people. And and they did their job uh, with less money because they were they already had established a, a democratic structure that uh, allowed for the communication so to, to so flow. So do you think that this is going to have an impact on the rest of the Puerto Rican working class and also American trade unions when they hear about the fact that there is this independent democratically run union that, that really fights for its members in a, in a broad way? Well, you know, it took the Puerto Rican Federation of Teachers uh, close to 25 years to really get to that level of organizing, to that type of organization they have today, that democratic type of structure, that kind of vision of social unions, of class-based union, took, took a number of years, but it, it's solid. And uh, I believe that it will probably take another few years before the impact of their lessons will really uh, 
produce results. But um, I believe, along with many other people in Puerto Rico, that it will have an impact because what surrounds us is a sea of corruption. It's an economic crisis that offers no alternatives to working class people. So I in that context, uh, organizations that, that really work on principle and that defend their members in effective ways uh, are bound to really provide a, a, a good alternative, a good example, and some an example that people can learn from. And I, in that sense, I, I think people will be impacted. Okay, well, you can find out more about the FMPR at fmprlucha.org. Uh, That's the website. And I want to thank you, uh, Pedro, for coming on. I think we've had a useful discussion. And I hope you come back because the question of the Puerto Rican teachers is connected with the struggle of American workers here and for all international labor. So thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, Steve. Los dibujos de ideas, las lecciones pacientes, las canciones que dejan, la esperanza naciera. Por estar inquietos